Okay, welcome to lecture 7.1. We're now going to move uh, out of kinematics and into mass distribution and mass and start to uh, formulate the second of three parts that we're going to need to piece together to make the equations of motion of multi-body systems. So let me switch to my Wacom. Um, So mass and mass distribution. All right, the first two basic concepts that we need to discuss are what is a particle and what is a rigid body. So a particle is simply going to be a point, which we've already discussed in the kinematics, uh, that, that has some mass. Right. And we're going to say that mass is the resistance to linear acceleration. And we'll more formally define that in a moment. And then we're also going to introduce the idea of a rigid body. Okay, um, a rigid body. So if I have some object in space here, I will call that body B. Um, and you can think of this as a collection of particles we've already defined that are bounded by some either volumetric shape or a surface or a curve. So we've got some infinitesimally small piece of mass um, uh, that sums up to make the mass distribution of this entire object. And we can locate each one of these little pieces of mass with some position vector relative to a point to um, fill out this continuous amount of mass. So we're going to call this a continuous distribution of mass. Uh, bounded by uh, volume, surface, or a curve. Okay, the total mass then, um, in a continuous sense, is if we integrate over all these little. Um, dm masses, we can get the total mass here of that rigid body. Uh, you can also think about if we have a volume, right, that is going to look more like some density as a function of that position r, right? Each um, uh, uh, part in the object may have a different density, and then we can integrate over some volumetric integral, which would probably be some triple integral, depending on how you've set up a coordinate system for that, whether you, um, you know, use Cartesian, spherical, um, cylindrical, etc. You could set this integral up if you want. Okay. And this uh, distribution of mass, mass, um, it uh, analogously resists um, angular acceleration. Mm -hmm. So, why are these two things important? The we're trying to arrive at equations of motion for a multi-body system. So if I uh, write the equations of motion of a single rigid body, in particle, Uh, then we can first write uh, Newton's second law of motion, sum of some forces acting on um, a particle 
uh, it's going to be equal to the time derivative of its linear momentum vector. Okay, so this is Newton's second law of a single particle. All right. And then this P is the uh, linear momentum of that particle. And it is, if the mass is a uh, constant, then it looks like that, where mass times some velocity vector. And so now, you know, we have mass here. Mass plays an important role in Newton's second law. Similarly, Euler's second law is that the sum of all the moments acting on a rigid body must equal the time derivative of the angular momentum of that body. Okay, so uh, h bar is a vector, angular momentum. And we're going to learn um, how to write h bar. h bar is a bit more complicated than a simple scalar mass times a, a vibrator. But if the uh, mass distribution is constant, we're going to be able to write an equation like this. Okay, so some uh, capital I term here. This is called the inertia. Okay, and I'm going to just say right now that it's not a scalar, and we'll talk about what that is uh, later in this lesson. Uh, but if I dot this uh, I with an angular velocity vector, then I can get the angular momentum. So the mass and the inertia are these two pieces that we want to talk about in this lesson. How do we formulate what those are? And um, uh, we're going to use them down the road so that we can arrive at um, Newton's and Euler's second law. We can write this. Um, and we'll be able to write these two for uh, collections of rigid bodies and particles. Okay, so these I've just written for a single rigid body or a single particle there. All right, so we're going to figure out this part, and I call this, we've already figured out V and omega, right, the kinematics of the system. And now we're going to figure out the mass um, and the inertia of the system, the mass distribution. And, uh, and then in the following chapter, we're going to figure out the left-hand side of these equations too, the sums of the forces and the torques. Okay. So, let's start then with mass here. So the first concept, we've already talked about uh, a mass of a particle and then some rigid body as a distribution mass. It would have a total mass if we integrate or sum up all the particles. Um, there's an idea uh, that we want to introduce called mass center, which you're probably familiar with. And then um, I'm going to talk about this from the standpoint of a collection of particles. So a rigid body is really just a collection of an infinite number of particles that have infinitesimal uh, size that we sum up. So uh, everything that I talk about from now on, I'm going to talk about the a collection of particles and how we can think about that as a distribution of mass. And um, there. Uh, it applies also to a rigid body, which is simply moving from a summation of a bunch of particles to a integral uh, form. Okay, yeah. and you can see more about that in the notes and in Kane's book. But we'll start here. If I have a set, I'll call it a set S of uh, new particles. All right, so P one. To P2, I'm oh, sorry, P nu. We have these particles, a set of particles. Um, we can calculate some things here. One, uh, which I've already done in integral form above. Uh, if I sum up all of the masses of these particles from I equals one to nu, then I'll get the total mass that I talked about before for that set of particles. The summation of each of the masses um, is also called the zeroth moment of mass. Mm -hmm. So it gives us the total mass of the system. 
Similarly, there's something called then the first moment of mass. And if I have um, a bunch of particles, then I say, well, all those particles are S, then um, I have a point O, I can draw a vector to the ith particle from O, my position vector there. And um, the first moment of mass then is going to be the sum of I from I equals 1 to nu of uh, this mass times this vector, the I from O. Okay. So this is the first moment of mass. And it's a uh, mass times a distance um, here. Now, uh, there's a special point that uh, exists such that this first moment of mass equals to zero. And this special point is going to be called the mass center. Um, the basic idea, which you all are probably or all should be familiar with from your first dynamics class, is that uh, uh, in a static sense, um, if I have this object and it's in a constant gravity, gravitational field, then um, the center of gravity equals its mass center. And uh, you can imagine uh, that this, if I balance this object on the center of mass, um, which is equal to the center of gravity in that case, that um, the object will be balanced. It will not tip over. So you can find this point, and, and I can do that right with my pen. If I uh, move my finger eventually without dropping my pen, I will find uh, that balance point, and that is going to align with the mass center in, in this constant gravitational field that I am in at the moment. So how do we uh, find that in the formal sense? Well, the um, first moment here can be written as, we can break up this vector. Um, and I'm going to break up this vector into a summation. But right? if I say that there's some special point here, and I'm going to call it S, so, uh, and that's going to be the mass center. And actually, let me move that a little bit lower. I can draw a vector to there. And that will be R from uh, to SO from O. But we know then that we can write. Uh, this expression um, nope, I'm confusing myself. that this, um, we're trying to find this vector to the mass center here, and uh, the O to SO and O to PI, oh yeah, uh, let me start over here. The first moment with respect to the mass center um, will be equal to zero, okay? So it is the mass center if the first moment with respect to the mass, uh, mass center SO is equal to zero. So I start there, sorry. And then I can rewrite this as MI, and then this is um, R EI from O minus R SI from O. Okay, so just this vector summation um, also has to be equal to zero. And then um, you can separate those, and we get m, i, and I'll leave off the uh, i equals 1 and, and the new 
is for quick writing equals the sum of mi r so to right and then finally if i'm looking for that we can write that the r that this vector to the mass center from o equals the first moment of all of the set of particles with respect to o equals one to nu divided by the zeroth moment of mass here right because this O to SO, right, doesn't change for each particle of mass. Sorry, I'm not getting this uh, perfectly described. But anyways, here is the uh, equation for the mass center. Okay, so it's the first moment divided by the zeroth moment, and we can find the mass center of any collection of particles. If this collection of particles um, is an infinite amount in some volume, surface, or curve, then these summations would turn into integrals, and you'd have to integrate over that um, uh, volume, surface, or curve entity. Okay? Uh, that's all I want to say there. You'll need to be able to calculate the mass center of collections of particles and potentially even uh, shapes of objects. All right. So we've got mass. We've got a, a mass center uh, for a collection. And then the last piece that I want to cover here then is um, what is mass distribution? Okay. So if you... <clears throat> Think of some point O, okay, and some point P. In this point P, we're going to call it a particle with a mass M. And then the I'm going to add a vector here, which I'll call N hat just a unit vector in some arbitrary direction. Uh, and I can draw then a line parallel to n hat that passes through O. It looks about parallel. Let's move it. Yeah. Okay. So um, I've got some line here passes through O, it's parallel to this vector in hat, and then I've got a particle, okay? So this idea of mass distribution is uh, going to be a resistance to angular acceleration, right? And so we have some kind of uh, idea of how, how this is resisting uh, angular motion. If I think about this point, this particle um, having to be accelerated around this line, the classic uh, idea that you're already familiar with is that there's a distance here. Oops. If I call that distance r, um, some scalar, then the second moment of mass is going to be for this particle about this line O that's parallel to N, um, something like MR squared, right? So this is the inertia, in this case, the moment of inertia of uh, this particle M, that's a distance R from this line that passes through O and parallel to N hat, okay? Um, you've calculated moments of inertia uh, in your prior dynamics class for these basic kind of situations. But a more general uh, definition is 
is an iner something called an inertia vector. Okay, and I can calculate that for a set of particles. We'll call that set of particles S um, with respect to a point O, just like we have above, um, about some unit vector, and I'm going to call our unit vector in hat A for this inertia vector definition. So then an inertia vector of the part of, set of particles S with respect to that point O about the in hat A vector, uh, unit vector, is going to be defined as the sum from i equals 1 to nu of all nu particles of the mass of that particle. And then we have a triple cross product. So it's going to be r from o to that particle, uh, the ith particle, crossed with the cross product of n a crossed with r b i. Okay, so that's the basic definition of this inertia vector. And well, what does this mean? So we've got this triple cross product. We've involved a mass, and we've got these two distances. So we can sort of see that there's a uh, an R squared like idea here, right? We've got a multiplication of uh, these two distance vectors. We have the direction here, and then we have to pass through this point O. Right, so it has similar information to uh, the simple idea that I showed you above. Um, and let's think, let's apply this then to a single particle. So we'll start with some point O and then some particle P that has a mass M. And I can make this vector here, O to P. Now, um, I'm going to give us a direction of some sort. So I'm going to put a dotted line through O, and then I will add this vector in hat. All right, so this line that passes through O is in the in A hat direction. OK. Um, now we've got this triple cost product that we want to manage. And the first cross product is in a crossed with this vector r p i to o okay so um, in a is a unit vector crossed with r p i in our case uh, p to o right if i uh, think of this angle here as some angle theta, right? And this works in 3D or 2D. I'm drawing it in 2D, but it, uh, uh, we're, we're thinking of a 3D space. So if I cross in a into that vector r, then I get a, a vector that points into the screen, right? And um, its magnitude, we know from the definition of the cross product is going to be the magnitude of NA, which is just one, so I don't need to write that, but times the magnitude of the other vector, just that, um, times the sine of the angle beta. Right? So we've got a, a vector that points into the uh, board or the sheet of paper. Um, that has this length and is scaled by the sine of theta and the magnitude of the distance from Rp. And uh, that um, R sine of theta is, um, I'll put it in green, I guess, and it's this uh, distance here. So this is uh, R. O magnitude 
magnitude sine theta if that's that distance. And that will be the length then of the vector that points, points into the board. Okay. All right. Well, the next uh, piece of the cross product is that we've got this thing that points into the board. Right? And we need to cross R from O to P to that. So if I cross that, um, I'm going to get this new vector. Right? It's going to be perpendicular to uh, the R vector. So this is perpendicular. It doesn't quite look like a square, but there we go. Um, we get this new vector here. Now this vector is in the direction of the inertia vector, I, uh, the capital I A. Right. So this is our I um, A. Okay. So in our case, S is only made up of one particle. And uh, so I'll just write P with respect to O there. And now the magnitude of IA uh, we've got this was the magnitude of the vector that we cross with this. So uh, similarly, we'll have uh, now R o magnitude squared sine of theta and then we also have our, our mass okay so now we see that the length of this uh, i a p with respect to o is scaled by r squared right it's mass so this is like an inertial uh, term that you might be familiar with but it's also scaled by this angle theta so this angle theta captures um uh, the orientation of NA with respect to R. Okay. Now, if NA, if we happen to choose NA that is aligned with the vector R P to O, then the sine of um, theta is zero. So there's no inertia, right? If if NA is aligned with the R vector, then uh, the mass lies on that line. And then we have no inertia. If NA happens to be perpendicular to R, then um, sine of 90 degrees is 1. And then we get the full uh, maximum M R squared uh, value there. Okay? So this inertia vector is always perpendicular to um, R from O to P in this case. And then the length of it scales with the mass, um, the length from O to P, and this uh, sine angle, sine of theta. Right? So that's sort of the geometric interpretation of, uh, uh, of this. So right, if uh, I'll just note these things down too. If theta happens to be equal to zero, we chose NA, uh, then uh, the magnitude of IA, there is no inertia. E O A equals zero. And then if theta equals 90 degrees, then the magnitude of that inertia vector is going to be equal to m r squared there. OK, so that's a single point, but we're talking about collections of points. So um, this IA vector is then going to be a sum of all of the collections of points. Save my document in case I crash. And uh, where's my. Oops, that's why I'm not doing anything. Here. Okay. So the next thing then, let's think well, what does that look like with two particles? We can draw a similar picture. Oh. And then I'm going to have a P1 with mass 1 and a P2 with mass 2. And then I'll have uh, some direction for NA. Save that. Do This is NA. 
And then we have these position vectors that go to each particle. And if I calculate this um, IA for each of the particles, we would get um, a couple of vectors. And they're, and they're going to be perpendicular. So I'll get one. I'll do this one in purple. And I'll do the other one in a light blue. Right. We would get two inertia vectors here, um, or two components of that, uh, or, or uh, components of that inertia vector. And let's call this one i hat with respect to n a um, of p two respect to o, and then this one is i hat respect to a p one with respect to o. So the total inertia vector then would be, I'll copy this, the summation of these two vectors, and I'll do that in, uh, let's just do that in orange. Mm. Oh, not that in orange. Yep. The next vector will be in orange. So the summation of those two, boom. Uh, is then I, and this is the set of both particles 1 and 2 with respect to A. Okay, so we get some summation of those two, and that forms the inertia vector there. Right, it's important to note that the inertia vector, uh, it contains the full information about the mass distribution of the set of particles. Okay, so we would draw these vectors out to every particle in 3D space, and we can figure out how they're distributed with respect to um, this line that passes through O is parallel to N hat A. Right. So let's look at an example next. What is, how is this? Uh, it's a little abstract, but um, I'll set up a coordinate system here. So I'm going to make uh, a few unit vectors, a 3D coordinate system, and I'll call uh, this in, and we'll have a uh, an x, n, y, and n, z. So an x, oops, no, n, x, n hat y, and n hat z. There. All right. So I want to then um, have some masses. So I'm going to make a little table. Um, we're going to have masses, and then I'm going to give them an x, y, and z coordinate. So mass 1, mass 2, mass 3, and mass 4. We'll keep those symbolic, but then I'll just assign a number uh, for the location here for each one. And I'll use some convenient numbers. It'll make this a little easier to calculate. So we've got these four masses, and they're located in 3D space here. If I sketch those out, then I can uh, locate these masses. So mass 1 is in the xy plane, uh, x3 and y4. So if we say that uh, that's 4, and this is 3, let's do that. All right, x, y plane there, and yeah. so we'll have a uh, in the y direction of four, and x direction of three. So it locates mass one, and then uh, mass two is in the y. Z plane, 
and uh, it will be at y equals 3 and z equals 4. So we'll put that one here, minus 2. Like so. And then mass 3 is in the xz plane at 4 and 3. So uh, that's x3, x4 is going to be a bit on here. And then uh, z3. So we'll come up to this location. Three move that down a little. Okay, and then lastly, M four is in the Y. Z plane also, and it is um, 4 in the Y and 3 in the Z. So it's going to put it this is uh, 4 in the Y, 3 in the Z, so right there. Okay, so we've got these four particles located in um, a simple Cartesian coordinate system, and then we've got these unit vectors that align with the Cartesian coordinate system in the in plane. Now, we want to calculate then the inertia vector of this. So I am going to hop over to a Jupyter notebook, and let's just do that there so we can see how that works. Yep, and make a new notebook. We'll call this one uh, this mass. All right, standard uh, situation here. Let's do uh, M1, M2, M3, and M4 to get us some symbols to work with for our symbolic masses. Okay. And then I need a, a reference frame to work with. And then we'll make these uh, various um, unit vectors, right? So I can do, I'll just call them R1 to go to mass 1, R2, and so on. So uh, R1 is uh, 3 times in x plus 4 times y. R2 equals three times in y plus four times in z. R3 equals four times in x plus three times in z. And R4 equals four times in y plus three times in z. All right. So that gives us these uh, unit vectors, and um, we can calculate the mass center. Right? So we know that the mass center is the, the first moment, which would be m times r1 plus m2 times r2 plus m3 times uh, r3 plus m4 times r4. So I can call that the first moment. 
and then the uh, zeroth moment, which is the mass, total mass, equals uh, M1 plus M2 plus M3 plus M4, and then the mass center is going to be the first moment divided by the zero moment. And this will give us the vector to the mass center of those particles. There we go. Pretty straightforward. Um, and and then, well, if we had numbers, then they would be, be more meaningful where that is, but uh, that's all it is to it to the mass center. Nothing big deal. Now let's calculate, though, the inertia vector. All right. So um, what I want to do here is calculate the inertia vector. All right, we're going to calculate the inertia vector of this set of particles. I'll call them S with respect to, and I'm going to have an origin point here, O. And then let's do them with respect to in X. So I'll call this X there. Okay. So we're going to calculate that inertia vector. Um, I of... Uh, I'll just call it I X. All right, so we need these cross products. Um, we know that we have uh, N dot X. It's going to be M E dot cross N dot X with our R1. And then um, mass 1 times M E cross of uh, R1, like so. All right, so that's the uh, first sum. So we've got mass 1, and then we've got this double cross product, Nx times R1, and then R1 times the result of that vector. Uh, if I only do 1, you'll see the result of that. And then I can copy uh, this. Oops. Copy this three more times and adjust to get the other contributions from the other particles. So we'll do M2, 3, and M4, and then um, similarly 2, 3, 4 for the vectors. We don't change in X because we're calculating all these with respect to that. And then I end up with, I don't need that extra plus, there. So here I've calculated the inertia vector, the inertia vector of these set of four particles using their position vectors. And then it's with respect to, in this case, the n, x um, unit vector, All right? So I get this. Uh, terminal term here, and we can see some distances squared, right? Four squared, five squared, three squared, and then here though, twelve. These aren't distances squared, uh, but they do amount to. Um, we have threes and fours, so we can see three times four equals twelve. So maybe that's where that's coming from, right? So we have this um, now inertia vector that describes the complete inertia of this system. Um, with respect to O and this unit vector X, okay? And we can see here, if you think about this, this actually, um, in looking at the diagram, if I think about the NX here, uh, the distances to M2 and M4, right, are both of length 5, so we have 25 and 25 for those. The distances uh, to M1 from NX is 4, uh, 4 squared is 16, the distance from O uh, NX to M3 is 3, so we get a 9 for that. Right? So this uh, measure number for NX looks like the moment of inertia of all these particles about that NX uh, line there. 
And then we've got these other things, these other pieces in Y. Well, what is that all about? Well, those are actually the uh, products of inertia associated with um, the NX and the NZ unit vectors, right? When we're thinking about uh, the inertia or the rotation, you can say about the NX vector, okay? So, the next idea here, and let me just hop back over to the little Markov screen, is that we can extract uh, from this an inertia scalar. And so I'm gonna write the result that we arrove at, arrived at. That was in the NX, and then we have minus 12 M1 and Y, and minus 12 M3 NZ. Okay, so from this inertia vector, we can extract the so called inertia scalars. And an inertia scalar of some set of particles S with respect to O um, with respect to that in A and with, then with respect to another unit vector is defined as such. So if I take the inertia scalar and I dot it with some other unit vector in B then I can get inertia scalar associated with that. Okay. So we sort of see from this uh, prior example, if an NB happens to equal NA, then we actually will always get the moment of inertia scalar about this NA equals NB axis, okay? And then if NB does not equal in A, we get these terms that are called products of inertia. Okay. And in Y and in Z are not in X, so the um, if we were to make in B here equal to in Y or in Z in the example above, then we get products of inertia terms. So, in for our example, nx is O dotted with nx equals 16m1 plus 25m2 plus 9m3 plus 25m4, and that is the moment of inertia about nx with respect to point O. Okay. And then similarly, if I take that inertia scalar and I dot it with the NY, then I get this negative 12 M1 term. And this is the XY product of inertia. And we could say, with respect to point O, there too. So we've got moments and products of inertia. So this is a, a very general way to dis, um, describe the distribution of any set of particles. And they can even be a set of particles that make up a rigid body uh, with respect to point O and some vector. And then we can extract from it um, these inertia scalars, OK? Um, and just as an example, right, I can calculate this inertia scalar with respect to any axis. So say I make an NA, and then uh, we can call it NX plus uh, NY plus uh, N dot Z. And then I'm going to normalize it. Right? So we have a unit vector. Um, and then I can calculate the inertia vector 
about an A for the same set of particles. Right? So I can pick any vector I want here. Oops, I didn't change my screen. Here we go. Um, so I created a some unit vector in A that's pointing in uh, a direction other than in X, in Y, or in Z. And then I calculate the inertia vector. I get this um, result. And if I um, then do IA dot with in A, this should give me the moment of inertia about that new axis. There we go. It's possible that could be simplified a bit. Maybe give us a simpler result. There we go. So that's the moment of inertia about this other arbitrary axis there. Okay. And then I can also calculate the product of inertia. I don't have to pick um, anything that's perpendicular. I could also, uh, in X is not perpendicular to NA in this case, and I could get the product inertia of inertia associated with those two vectors. Okay. So that's how you make use of these inertia vectors. All right, so we'll come back to, no, keep, uh, come back to the Wacom, let's make a new page. Uh, just to discuss a bit about like, you know, what is, what is, what is this moment of inertia and product of inertia? What's the difference in them? What, they do, what do they sort of mean? Let's take an example here um, of two particles. And uh, I'm going to have our point O. And then I'm going to have um, two particles that have the same mass. And I'm going to make a line here, a vertical line. And I'll just call this uh, in. So I'm going to call this. Uh, direction of this vertical line, it'll be in the in hat uh, A direction, right? And um, these two particles, I'm going to say, are a distance three away from here. Let's draw this. So this distance. Is three, and this distance is three. Okay, so these two particles are both a distance three away from uh, this axis that passes through O and is parallel to in A. Okay, if I think about spinning these two particles about that line uh, that passes through O, um, you would imagine that these uh, are balanced, right? Um, I could have a nice um, unbalanced I'm sorry, a balanced spin, right? Because I have equal mass at the same distance from the axis there, right? If I calculate the inertia vector for each of these, um, recall that we, you know, get these position vectors, which I'll draw in red, that take us to there. And then we get associated inertia vectors, and those inertia vectors are perpendicular to each of the um, red vectors are. So I'll, I'll make uh, our inertia vector for the first one perpendicular and not quite drawing it perpendicular, but there we go. That's better. So perpendicular. And then um, the inertia vector from this one, right? We're going to do an NA cross into that. We get a vector pointing down. And then if I cross um, the position vector into NA, 
or into that vector, uh, I'm sorry, the vector pointing up, then I get a, a vector perpendicular in this fashion to the left-hand side part. So, perpendicular. And because these are both the same distance, and we have theta would be then the same for both sides, uh, these two vectors, the purple ones, are of the same magnitude. Right? So they're of the same length. And um, if, and so these have, oops, these are both at the same height here, but they're just pointing at, the, at different directions, right? Now, um, yeah, I do want to, let me change, I don't want to call, let me call this NX instead of NA. So call that NX. And then I'm also going to add a NY here. So, um, let's work out what this inertia vector would be. And um, yeah, I'm going to give a few more dimensions so we can actually, the length of our position vector here is going to be five, right? And then that, that would make this leg uh, of length four. Okay, so we have these right triangles. And uh, let's calculate then the inertia vector of these two particles, S about point O, with respect to that NX. Right. So if you um, do that, we can do that uh, back on Jupiter. I'll keep pressing the wrong button there. All right, so we're going to have R uh, to particle 1 is going to be equal to 3 times be negative 3 times n dot y plus 4 times uh, n dot x. And then the particle on the left, and I guess I can call this particle on the right. I'm drawing a particle on the left uh, equals positive 3 times n dot y plus 4 times n dot x, right? And then i x will be this inertia vector. Um, I'll just copy and paste my typing up here. So let's get this one because it matches perfectly. Syntax error. There's my syntax error. Oh, a dot instead of the times. Okay, so we get this inertia vector. Um, and we're going to just do. M equals SM dot space. All right, so both the masses are the same. And R, R1 and RR, I can those. There we go. No syntax error. Yep. So notice, 
And I guess it's going to be worth just looking at these two components, right? Because that's not obvious. Notice when I calculate these two pieces separately, that I get a, a plus 12 and a minus 12, right? And if we go back to the figure, well, that's pretty clear. I'm just going to sum up these two um, purple vectors. And if I do so, then I'm only going to get a resulting vector that is um, aligned with an x. So I only get a component here that's aligned with an x. So this is i uh, x uh, so where this is this i um, particle on the left with respect to o x and this is particle on the right with respect to o. Yeah. So that minus 12 plus 12 m uh, go away and we end up only with uh, an inertia vector that happens to be aligned with nx. Okay. So there are no products of inertia in this case. If I dot our ix with you know, or with a ny, ix dot ny, obvious, right? There, there's no component in that direction. So I have no products of inertia, okay? And this is tied to the fact that this is balanced about this axis, if we think of it as an axis of rotation, okay? I have symmetry here, and that causes an inertial balancing, and thus we have no products of inertia. We only have a moment of inertia. Now, if we look then um, at the case, though, where we only have one of those masses, then let's get rid of that since we didn't use it. We did that on the computer. Um, so in the same situation, uh, if I have O, O and a mass here, and then the position vector, and then I would only have this inertia vector here. Um, and then we have, once again, an X and an Y. Right. The uh, inertia vector then has an NY and an N NX component. Okay. And we would get this um, I the inertia vector of this particle on the right. That's all we have this time. With respect to O and X is going to be equal to um, 9 m x plus this 12 m and y right so we have a moment of inertia of 9 m here but i x b r with respect to o dotted with and y it's going to be this 12 m right so we have a product of inertia if i were to spin this single mass about the axis and then we have an imbalance, okay? This is not symmetric about the spin axis in X. And the product of inertia tells us about the anti-symmetry of the mass distribution. So that's the significance of this. It captures this effect that we would get due to the anti-symmetry. So products of inertia um, capture anti-symmetry of mass distribution, and the moments of inertia um, are strictly about uh, the values that capture um, what the distribution is about some spin axis. Uh, so we need both of those to know, and they're going to play a big role when we calculate the angular 
momentum of an object and whether or not that will be a balanced or unbalanced spin. Okay, I think that's then what I want to tell you here on this first video.